farming, food and fashion for a discerning world is serious business in Aotearoa, New Zealand. There are new opportunities everywhere just waiting for the open-minded. Sarah's Country shines a light on the matters that matter most. And here's your host, Sarah Perriam. Kia ora and welcome to Sarah's Country where we take farming, food and fashion very seriously because our global consumers do as well. Now, prior to the pandemic and lockdowns, the movement of people wanting to get closer to the source of what nurtures their bodies and adorns their homes uh, was escalating. And having the world's eyes upon Aotearoa New Zealand over the past year has only continued of how we've continued to handle COVID. And our global leadership position with climate change is positioning us favourably for our future. Now, Sierra's Country is brought to you in strategic alliance with the country's largest rural newsroom, Farmers Weekly, and the team at Global HQ that make up the journalists and analysts that position you favourably to make the most informed decisions as a farmer or grower or those working or investing in the primary sector or simply interested in how we process and market our fine products for here from New Zealand. Now, I'm your host, Sarah Perriam, and we're live on Monday nights from 7pm, kicking off the week with another Newsmaker Show. And if we followed through the top stories in this week's Farmers Weekly newspaper, of which all can be found online at farmersweekly.co.nz. Before we get underway with what you can discover on the show today, some bad news and some good news. Now, the bad news is, uh, of course, the struggles of a Level 3 lockdown in Auckland and Level 2 across the country affecting our rural events under pressure has uh, fallen the 61st Golden Shears due to be held this week in Masterton and the Northland Field Days both cancelled. Our thoughts are with the organisers and everybody that was travelling there and in an update at 5 o'clock today uh, Wanaka Show will make a decision on whether it proceeds uh, by 8pm Tuesday on its Facebook page. Central Districts and South Island Field Days are working through their COVID response. Now it's the peak of our rural social calendar, March I call it Mad March, <laughs> to be honest, for, for people that work in, the, in, in a lot of these events. Uh, you're stretched all across the country, and I absolutely wouldn't change it. I love connecting uh, face-to-face with all of my family and friends and colleagues within the sector. And, of course, some deserved interaction for our exhibitors after what uh, 2020 brought them. So here's hoping that it is only seven days. Our thoughts are, are with you. Uh, and the good news is that we have the coolest prize giveaway I've ever done on the show. Uh, of course, because it's the first giveaway we've ever done on the show. Thanks to our friends Sophie and Sam Hurley farming at Papua Nui Estate and also bringing you the classy, luxurious woolen luggage accessories known as Honest Wolf. Now, if you've got a phone and that phone can send text messages you can enter what all you need to do is enter alongside the few hundreds that already have gone in the draw by Wednesday the 3rd of March Uh, simply text prize to 4040 and you can go in the the draw to win an overnight bag they're absolutely gorgeous and valued at nearly $400 each Now, the cattle disease, Mycoplasma bovis, changed the lives of many New Zealand farmers, as well as the way we emphasise biosecurity on farm. So, what lessons can be learned? Uh, I know our listeners and viewers can list off one as long as there are. Uh, In New Zealand's largest biosecurity response we've had to date. So, we're going to have Calvin Smith, who's the independent chair of the MBOVIS program on Serious Country, to explain uh, what the intention of an independent review will be to find out uh, what lessons. And uh, I'd like to put some questions from you, our live audience, wherever you're watching across the web uh, to Calvin and so simply just put in the comment section below uh, and I'll get a chance to ask my questions as well as yours and then we've got the latest long range rural weather forecast with no other than Phil Duncan from ruralweather.co.nz and what is happening in this month of March ahead Uh, autumn is so interchangeable and so unpredictable But when you've got Phil at the helm, uh, is there any almighty moisture around the corner? Phil will have the latest for us 
as well as one of Sarah's country's uh, listeners and viewers that have entered into My Rural Weather, where you can get your own personalised detail forecast right here on Sarah's country. We have selected one out and we're going to head to Hawke's Bay. Now, to close the show, the Ministry for Primary Industries Principal Scientist, Gerald Reese shares uh, with us on the show his 45 years in the public sector as a strong advocate for grassland agriculture, which has seen him awarded the Ray Brougham Trophy for the New Zealand Gra- Grasslands Association. I'm looking forward to having a yarn to Gerald uh, to reflect on how far we have come, or maybe haven't, in various areas. But to kick off the show and on a positive, you could say, some some good news uh, for your serious country newsmaker is how New Zealand's brand image of being young, positive and human uh, due to our young female Prime Minister has shone the spotlight on New Zealand's food and beverage companies who are saying that it has never been a better time to leverage our story globally. Regardless of whether you like it or not, uh, it certainly has made some significant changes to our global consumer attitudes to New Zealand uh, and our handling of COVID-19. And New Zealand Stories director Rebecca Smith will be with us very shortly to explain what some of these distinct changes in attitudes towards New Zealand that have come out of a global survey. This is Sarah's Country, produced in alliance with Farmers Weekly, the place New Zealand farmers turn to for a trusted source of in-depth agricultural journalism. Stay connected to the matters that matter most by subscribing to My Daily Digest at farmersweekly.co.nz. Oh, nice boots. Yeah, thanks. They're new. <laughs> ben, Ben, you all right? Oh, yeah, sorry, mate. Just me getting pretty hardy. Eh? Yeah, I just said to myself, Ben, work hard. You deserve new boots. Now, consumers in New Zealand's main markets have slowed down, uh, whether they liked it or not, of course, because of lockdowns around the world. But they have uh, gotten closer to nature and, according to one survey, finally realised that New Zealand and Australia are indeed two different countries. And you'd like to say cricket teams too, after how it's been going. Uh, New Zealand Stories Director Rebecca Smith joins us now on Serious Country to discuss uh, the latest New Zealand Global Perception Survey run by the New Zealand Story and Export New Zealand. Uh, welcome to Serious Country, Rebecca. I really appreciate your time uh, to unpack this. We did have a discussion uh, around that as you were going through the various different countries, but have we got to a bit of a collective uh, survey and general feeling across how people think of New Zealand. Absolutely. So we've been able to sum all of that up and we've had some other research and insights come over through the last, over few, the last months few months as well months. that have given us, given us a really interesting picture about how our tackling of COVID has impacted perceptions of New Zealand. And whilst it's a horrific um, thing that everyone is going through, we've had an unlikely positive uptick for New Zealand because of the way that we've been handling it. And it has had an impact on how consumers view our food, our beverage, our primary sector uh, and other things that we have to offer. Mm. We highlighted a few things there, which is positive. They finally know that New Zealand is a separate country, not a state of Australia, which is fantastic. Um, but we have talked on the show a lot about the rise of national protectionism within our markets and that being a risk and a threat to New Zealand, uh, not so much? 
Uh, no, you're right. There are definitely some changing consumer behaviours that we're seeing. So people, so people are, are, just as, as we are here, we are in, New here in New Zealand, buying more local, being very conscious of supporting their and um, their local businesses, their local producers. So that's happening all around the world. And that's really changing how people are consuming, the choices they're making in terms of buying. And that's a potential risk for New Zealand. Um, so what we have to do is really differentiate and make sure that we stay prominent on those shelves and in those markets because, uh, you know, their choices are are local and their belts are tightening. They don't have as much money to spend often. In many countries, they're suffering more than we have economically. Uh, So we've got a job to do to, to remain front of mind. In front of mind, our COVID messages, such as uh, the team of 5 million and go hard, go early, came through in the survey. Uh, you know, whether you're a personal fan of our Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern here in New Zealand or not, uh, the fact that she's seen as a compassionate, um, young, positive female with leadership skills has really transformed us away from the Lord of the Rings stigma hasn't it? It has. It's really put us on the world map. And as you say, whether you agree or disagree, what we do know is that New Zealand has now, you know, we've got the eyes of the world on us. People now know where we are, roughly. Um, They know that we're not the same as Australia. They can distinguish us. Um, And they can see that we're a forward-thinking, contemporary, more independent country than they might have given us credit for in the past. So we've definitely shifted from being being a beautiful natural place with not much going on to an interesting country that they're looking for for inspiration and also just a little bit of hope. How do we tell our story when our marketers can't be in market? Yeah, good question. Um, We have to get a lot more inventive in terms of the way that we're delivering our stories digitally. Um, Now is the time to invest in some of those areas that we may not have felt were important before, or we just had it on the back burner. So, you know, making sure that our social media channels are really well run. Um, Putting some of that, that, um, you know, that delicate travel budget into marketing promotion in market, supporting our distributors supporting our retailers and putting things into their hands that help them to market our products more effectively Um, and getting really good at Zoom and getting really good at pitching um, with not much time. So it's it's honing those skills. I have learned a lot since doing this show for the last nearly coming up 12 months, Rebecca, in the global reach of everything that we do now in media and as our rural broadcasters, the way we internally talk to each other within our market, we have to take that responsibility um, that that message is going global as well. So, yeah, it's um, but what a great opportunity as well that we've got that global reach. It is. And, um, you know, we don't want to be opportunistic with this. And yet we have an opportunity to leverage this very positive position that we have in the world. People do see New Zealand as as a beacon, as a country that does things differently. We've trusted, we've got integrity, we're taking care of people. And all of that adds to the sense that whatever they're purchasing from us in the world of food and beverage contributes to their well-being. It contributes to being good for them. And that's a positive for our food providers. It's interesting because uh, we speak on the show a lot to the likes of um, our velvet producers, our honey producers, a lot of foods that have some fantastic immunity based um, properties and can really leverage on that uh, time that we're in as well. Uh, How do we take our story of production from beyond um, just being lovely people? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's that's really good point um, because people generally do think we're quite nice and and we're not terribly threatening and we're we're very warm and and welcoming. But we've got to get further than that and explain why is it better for you. Really getting under the skin of those consumer insights and why is it different. And that's what consumers are going to make their choices based on. Can I get it here in my own country? Is it something that I could substitute here locally? Or is this something that I can't get anywhere else in the, you know, can't get here? What is different about it? Why is it better? How is it going to make me stronger, faster, brighter, healthier? So all of those benefits we really need to dial up at a time like this and focus on what's different. Why should they care?
Mm. The rise of uh, filmmaking in New Zealand is something I watch um, closely because I see it is a huge opportunity for us to tell the, the New Zealand way of life because when you're consuming a product from another country, you're effectively consuming the culture and the lifestyle of that, that country. Is there more work that we can be doing in the synergies between our um, silver screen and, and our food and beverage? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we've got an incredibly creative sector here and uh, and they're available and bar the occasional lockdown that we have at the moment, we can actually, we're one of the few countries that can continue to produce and to market ourselves really actively and get on screen and get good content out. Um, so we've got to take advantage of that opportunity. We've got amazing creative people. It doesn't actually cost the earth um, you know, the research that we did last year, we did it all via Zoom. We did. Um, we've done recordings via Zoom. It, it's amazing what you can achieve if you've got to. And I think New Zealanders are really, really good at solving problems and coming up with new ways of doing things. And now's the time to do that. How do we market it to get that tone right so uh, we are being respectful to the rest of the world situation as opposed to rubbing it in their noses? Yeah, absolutely. We've got to be quite mindful that other people are going through really traumatic um, challenges. You know, we've got children who have been back at school. Other people have had kids who have been at home homeschooling for a whole year and haven't been back to school. So that's a really difficult um, situation for people to be in. So we do have to be very mindful of that in terms of getting that tone right, focusing on what it will do to help them really honing in on what we're here to do that can help them, help their family and improve the situation that we're in. We definitely don't want to talk up, you know, look at us, we're COVID free, eh? because we're not. Um, and we never, you know, we can never promise that. Um, so we do have to be a bit careful about that whole safety piece um, and not play on it too much, but just talk about the benefits for customers and consumers. Mm. Oh, thank you so much, Rebecca. What is the next stage in continuing to monitor perception of and your role with New Zealand Story? Well, this research that we did that we've talked about today, we did in June last year to try and understand what was changing during COVID so we could really make sure that all our messaging internationally was tailored and, and relevant. What we need to do now is touch base again with those consumers and find out what's shifted again. How are things changing? Because it is just changing so rapidly. We have to keep on top of that. And then I can come back and talk to you about the new set of insights and, and any more tweaks and changes we need to make to the way that we're all telling our stories and all marketing ourselves internationally. It's very valuable insights collectively uh, created with the work you do. So all our, our exporters don't have to do that consumer insights individually. So uh, thank you so much. Rebecca Smith here from the New Zealand Story, the Director of New Zealand Story. Story. And of course, uh, there's more information on that head along um, online and you can find uh, the work that the New Zealand Global Perception Survey have done. And uh, of course, great work to export New Zealand and keeping us a forefront um, in terms of our decisions moving forward. Now, after the break, what have we learnt as a country in our bid to eradicate Mycoplasma bovis? Well, in Bovis's programs, uh, Independent Chair Calvin Smith is going to explain what the independent review of the cattle eradication uh, program has been and the status of depopulating Five Star Beef's 18,000 cattle feedlot. All that up next here on Sarah's Country. This is Sarah's Country. Catch the latest on the matters that matter most wherever you are. Listen to Sarah's Country on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple or Google Podcasts. Try asking Alexa or Siri... Play Sarah's Country on podcast. Australia and New Zealand are home to some of the world's most innovative farming pioneers. Zomatic is proud to partner with farmers who are committed to leading the way in sustainable water management. The Trailblazer Sustainable Irrigation Awards celebrate sustainable irrigation management, irrigation-driven improvements, waterway protection and environmental stewardship. See how our Trailblazers are leading the way at irrigationtrailblazer.com slash winners. One of the first things you learn when you live out here is where to shop and the things you need to live out here. Like electric fencing. Or horse feed. Or bee suits. <laughs> 
Children. Chuck food. Do you want a couple of these? Or something stylish to wear. Not everyone's got stuff like this. But at Farmlands we do, and then some. So if you need anything to help your farm... Grow. Milk. Dredge. Rear. Come on in. Cos we're out here too. Well, following Farmers Weekly journalist Annette Scott's continual investigation into the state of our Mycoplasma bovis eradication program, uh, you can read more at farmersweekly.co.nz, of course, keeping you up to date. An independent review to find the lessons that can be learned uh, now uh, from New Zealand's largest biosecurity response. Embovis was first detected in New Zealand 10 months later. Uh, it was um, considering the impact of what it was on the farming and the economy. The Ministry for Primary Industries and industry partners uh, for the likes of Beef and Lamb and Dairy and Z Federated Farmers embarked collectively on what would be a world first plan to eradicate the cattle disease. Uh, we're joined now by Embovis's program's independent chair, Calvin Smith. Uh, evening, Calvin. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us and also, of course, uh, taking the time to set about an independent review, I believe, is being uh, welcomed by the industry. Could you please set the scene for us on your involvement with the programme and your experience? Okay, well, I've been involved as the chair of the governance group of the program for roughly two years now. So I wasn't there right at the start of the program. So when I talk about the governance group, that's the three fund funding partners, which is the government. Uh, and so that's MPI on behalf of the government, uh, Dairy and Z, and Beef and Lamb New Zealand. So they are the three funding partners. And about two years ago, they decided that they needed uh, some independence on their governance group. So the three chief executives of those organisations, that's Ray Smith from MPI, Tim Mackle, who's the CEO of Dairy and Z, and Sam McIver, who's CEO of Beef and Lamb, because obviously they've all got other day jobs and Bovis is not the only thing they deal with. So they asked me to come in and just cheer the, cheer the board that sits over it, just to make sure we had some good governance oversight uh, in the program going forward. And in the last couple of years, uh, what's been sort of your biggest learnings before we even sort of get into the process of doing a review? Well, as you say, the independent review is also about learning lessons about uh, how this response was handled, and that's all about uh, looking forward and strengthening the biosecurity system. But obviously there's been a lot of learnings on the way through, and because this, this had never been done before on this scale, and so uh, there was no manual to say, this is how you um, manage and eradicate M. Bova. So there was a lot of learning as you went through, because there was not too much known about uh, the disease itself, how it spread, it's... Um, genetic makeup, all that sort of thing. So a lot has been um, learned along the way. It's been very science-driven as well. As more has been found out about the disease, that's been applied to the program and the way the eradication and the locking down of farms and the depopulation and the cleaning has gone on. Mm. There seems to be uh, multiple different silos to what could be the independent review um, from a science perspective right through to the human toll uh, on people's welfare as well. Um, Calvin, would you be able to outline how you would like to see this review play out? Well, th there's a couple of things there. We've we've had a technical advisory group mm. come in and have a look at the program uh, two or three times on the way through, but the, the key to them was the technical nature, so they, they very much focus on the technical aspects of the review. In the early days, it was really uh, looking at the feasibility of eradication, understanding um, how the disease spread, and provide, because the technical advisory group was made, made up of um, technical uh, disease management experts, and they helped develop um, a lot of the tools that were used in terms of estimating the disease spread uh, and you know, the way lockdowns. It's, it was really about um, tracking down animals that were moving, and so a lot of that was about understanding how the disease might spread. It's a bit like what's happening with COVID and tracing, and there was a big effort went into the tracing. And so the technical advisory group were very good at giving advice around that sort of thing. This review is quite different. We've deliberately excluded the technical aspects of the review and more looking at how the program evolved over time and what lessons we learnt from the way that response was managed, and that can be applied in the future. So it's not looking back and applying blame where things may not have gone as well as they could have been. It's all about saying, look, we tried this, this is what we did, we can improve that and we can apply that for the future. 
and that's what the most important part is. I think the big question will be, will you be uh, surveying and getting responses from those on the front line that dealt with uh, the response to formulate those lessons? We definitely will be because it would be no good if we didn't hear the voice of farmers affected and impacted by this because we know for the farmers affected it has been a really dramatic, had a dramatic impact for those who lost their herds and lost their livelihoods and they might have been uh, building up breeding herds over many generations. So the impact has been quite devastating and also uh, we'll be talking to people who are supporting farmers uh, and also allied industries that were impacted by this, you know, people like local vets, um, Rural support trusts and I have had a big role in supporting farmers. We'll be talking to them and um, people like uh, livestock firms, uh, transport firms, anyone who uh, had some involvement in it will be invited to take part. Yeah, well, that was probably the leading question is that the people, the farmers I've spoken to uh, across multiple different medias I've been involved in, all they always say is I'm telling my story so that some other farmer doesn't have to go through um, what I had been through. And I'm, I'm sure they would love to know how they can put their hand up and share uh, their advice, their thoughts, their lessons, their experience with the review. Are you able to um, suggest how people can get in touch? Uh, the review team themselves, they will be coming out and inviting that input. Right. Because the re- now that we've set up the review team, uh, they're independent and they've developed a work program and they're being supported by a secretariat. And so they're developing their work program, but high on their list of things to do is engage with the people who are impacted by this. And we're talking about the the review panel members, Professor Nicola Chabolt, uh, Dr. Roger Paskin and uh, Tony Cleland, who is the chairman of FMG, uh, all as well as, uh, sorry, Professor Caroline Sanders, Saunders as well. Um, very, very experienced people. How did you pull together the review panel? Well, the governance group uh, commissioned the review, so that, that's the three funding partners, the three CEOs I talked about. I'm on the panel as an independent, so not connected to them, and we've, we've got one other independent member at the moment, um, Stuart Hutchings, who's a disease management expert, and him and I, as the independents, were charged with um, – Secretariat to go out and source suitable applicants. Now, we're, the, the governance group um, gave us a broad outline of the type of skills we'll be looking for to bring independence and credibility. And one of the big things we looked for was when their report's finally published and say a farmer who was impacted looked at the report, it had to have credibility and had the people doing the re- review had to have that credibility. So we came up with quite an extensive list of names and just went through a process till we landed on uh, a group of four people who had quite a broad range of experience and um, we thought brought expertise and credibility to the review. Mm. And uh, where will the outcome of the review be published and form part of advice for biosecurity responses into the future? Yes, it will. So the results will be will be made public, and uh, the MPI uh, will be really interested in the outcomes as far as they go in terms of strengthening the system, because they're always interested in improving the system. There's a review of the Biosecurity Act going on at the moment, but everyone wants to know what do we need to do to improve our situation, improve our readiness for whatever might happen next. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the team of five million, including um, the farming sector, want to be ready for anything that is worse than what we've dealt with in the past, 100%. Whilst I've got you here, Calvin, can I talk to you about uh, the depopulation of uh, New Zealand's largest feedlot, Five Star Beef, with uh, 18,000 cattle? Uh, What can you tell us about the program that's going on there? Well, it, it has, um, it, it's, it's been made public that the feedlot has got infected cattle on it and at some stage that will have to be depopulated. But just at the moment, because it has a lot of uh, farms supplying it, um, MPI wants, and the program want to make sure that they know where the source of infection coming into the feedlot is and then eventually that will be depopulated. Okay, so our chief science, well, the chief science advisor at MPI is currently working through uh, some terms of reference to work out what's the best approach to managing uh, five star. Uh, so there's no depopulation going on at the moment. Uh, it's just really in the review, just work out what's the best approach, and that that those terms of reference will come back to the uh, Michael Plasma Bovis Governance Group uh, to sign off on.
And and whereabouts are we at at the moment in regards to the response and how you're feeling uh, about the program to date? Well, I think the program's at um, a really good stage. There's only 10 active confirmed properties left in the country, and in t- and that's down from 28 this time last year. So in total, since the response started, uh, we've had 261 confirmed properties. Now 251 of those have been cleared, so that's leaving the current 10. And all 10 of those are in mid-Canterbury. So putting that aside, we think the response is in a very good place, but it's it, it's like a COVID. We can't become complacent, and we need um, farmers in particular to be quite vigilant in terms of recording cattle movements and being quite careful about movements between properties because that is the main uh, source of transmission to cattle between cattle and cattle moving. And really the, that's what the program's been doing in the last two years is tracing cattle movements just to really uh, and lock down farms that, that the cattle have been moved to so we can eradic- contain and eradicate the disease. Mm. And and uh, your dealings with uh, Osprey uh, and Nate through the review process, will that be interconnected? Well, the, the next phase... We're in what we call the delimiting phase, and that's where you're tracing animals, locking down farms, testing, and depopulating as necessary. Eventually, we'll reach the stage where the last animal has been traced, and we will believe that the infection has been contained. It's not spreading anywhere else. We then go into a long-term surveillance program so that we can say, look, we are free from disease. Now, that, that could take six to eight years of testing, ongoing testing, and the testing happens in several ways. The, there is ongoing surveillance of the beef herd at the moment, and all milking herds uh, get tested through what we call the bulk tank milk test. And that, that's what showed up in the spring um, that led to us finding bovis on these properties in mid Canterbury, And that, that's what was expected because... Coming into the spring, that's the, that's the time when cows are stressed and lactating and they, they can be susceptible to the disease. And also, um, two-year-old heifers came into the milking herd for the first time. That were cows back in 2018. So we expected some to actually have bovis that have reappeared in the milking herd. So look, to answer the question, we're, we're in a very positive place, but we, we still have to make sure that there's no spread from the current infected herds and the five-star um, beef feedlot issue is dealt with. Mm. And a lot of learnings from our TB eradication program uh, that we've learnt in Embovis and one from Embovis what we've learnt in our COVID response. So you could say as a country we, we do learn um, and yeah. we will learn more from the independent review of the Mycoplasma Bovis program. Uh, independent Chair Calvin Smith uh, joining us there to give us a bit of an update. Of course, thanks to Annette Scott from Farmers Weekly bringing us the coverage, uh, keeping us up to date on where the program is at. Now, after After the break, Rural Weather's Phil Duncan has the latest in your detailed weather update to see how much moisture is coming in March. Uh, And of course, a very nifty fog forecaster on ruralweather.co.nz. It'll be handy for mustering, duck shooting and even predicting thunderstorms. This is Sarah's Country. Join the conversation. Have thoughts on an interview? Or have you got questions you want answered by a future guest? Let us know. Email sarah at sarahscountry.com. here in New Zealand through the autumn it's kind of like the lyrics of a Kenny Rogers song you know the lyrics you've got to know when to hold them know when to walk away know when to run uh, I mean the, the weather throughout our autumn seasons is so interchangeable that making decisions is mind-blowingly difficult we had to hold on to stock or to sell uh, because it's so interchangeable at any one time I was reading through the Farmers Weekly this week and I've always loved Steve Wynn Harris's opinion pieces from Hawke's Bay and he said they should give me a ring in a month because if it hasn't rained by then uh, then of course they are looking at being in a consecutive drought 
Following weather is a farmer's daily task as well as our next guest, rural weather's Phil Duncan. Uh, Phil, just before we get off, are you a um, Kenny Rogers fan? <laughs> Actually, I am, and that song, isn't that, um, that's what they play in a bar whenever they're trying to shut the bar down, is they play the, the gambler, at least they used to when I used to go out. <laughs> yeah, hey, we're going to turn to Hawke's Bay uh, shortly, but Climate Watch's outlook for March, how's that La Nina looking? Yeah, so um, we've issued our first um, March climate update today. You can find it on the Rural Weather website. We've got a, a new story with 11 maps in there. And we've also got a video about it, which is a 10 minute special video. Um, we're really looking at the big picture that's coming up at the moment. And with La Nina starting to sort of fade away uh, very, very slowly, but, but at the same time, one step back with that, but one step forwards with the fact that the sea surface temperatures are now at their highest. So that still means we've got a chance for some rain. Um, the, the month of March is kicking off dry, as we all know. So the North Island's drier than average, the Eastern South Island much drier than average. You know, you're into that extreme edge of the scale there and when we look at the temperatures for the month this is rainfall just yet but temperatures the north island 0.5 degrees half a degree above average the south island half a degree to one degree above average for the month ahead so it's still a little bit la nina-esque but speaking of la nina we do have a bit of rain this is the next three days rain coming up and what we're seeing is on the west coast all totals of over 120 millimeters of rain so plenty coming for them but for almost everybody else much lower rainfall totals especially on this eastern side where there's almost none falling now that's just three days but this is two weeks out now at a glance and for those who are listening um, it's just a blob of color but what we're looking at to the north and the tropics this is the area where we're expecting a cyclone to form in the next few days so that's very typical of March. So even though La Nina is fading, the sea surface temperatures up here are going to produce a low that's going to make 300 millimetres of rain up in the tropics. But there's a dry belt between New Zealand and the tropics, thanks to high pressure, where there's almost no rain falling just north of New Zealand. New Zealand itself, I just mentioned the west coast has got a lot of rain coming, over 200 millimetres, in fact, in the next two weeks. But on the eastern side, the green and yellow colouring you see on the uh, map of New Zealand shows just 10 to 20 millimetres over two weeks. So that is not a lot of rain uh, yet to come still. So I think March is going to kick off a little bit like La Nina, but um, not perfectly the way that many people would like. We still don't have those those big rainfall numbers. Oh, Phil, you didn't make any friends there, particularly in the East Coast in Canterbury um, and, of course, in Hawke's Bay. But just when you're talking there around those numbers in the West Coast, I mean, we all know it. Uh, the rain falls very heavily. But is that the sort of numbers that the West Coast should be concerned about with um, surface flooding, et cetera? Maybe a little bit, um, but not too much. I mean, this is spread out over two weeks. Um, the West Coast is leaning a little bit wetter than average, uh, but it's not looking too bad. I think what, the, what we're going to notice a lot more of is cloud. A lot of cloud around the country now. Um, that also leads to fog and other things like that. So we're into that time of year where, um, as you say, like <laughs> the gambler song is brilliant because that kind of is what we're dealing with with autumn weather. You know, some days you've got to kind of work out, is this week going to end like it started or will it end completely the opposite? Um, this week's one of those weeks. The first week of March kicks off with northerlies and humidity and ends with southerlies and a temperature drop. And it already has that autonomous feel. And uh, on my morning walk, the chorus of the ducks is coming in, getting many a duck shirt at very excited. So the idea of having a fog forecast uh, at ruralweather.co.nz is quite exciting um, for that. Uh, but uh, could you explain to us more around why and how we read fog? Yeah, so um, one of the issues we had, or I had growing up, was that you'd always find that, you know, the airports were closed due to fog, or they're not closed, but the flights were all delayed and cancelled. Um, a lot of people in this country travel from our small regional airports to other ones, and so we got thinking, what can we do better in this area? We've got all the data with IBM, so how do we produce that into something? So at the Rural Weather website, when you first log on to it, you've got these buttons at the top, and if you click on the fog and cloud one, it adds our Fog forecaster. It's the only one in New Zealand. In fact, I got a feeling it's pr pretty much the only one in the world. I've struggled to see them in other countries. So it's a unique New Zealand product. And when you click on it, what it does is this example here for Hamilton Waikato, classic place for fog. It shows a couple of risks here, just very fine possible fog, uh, Thursday morning, Wednesday morning. Another feature you might have noticed, thunderstorms both of those days. That's quite a common thing. If you've got fog in the morning, 
means you've got moisture, calm weather in the afternoon when you add some daytime heating, produces thunderstorms. But we do have this possible risk here. Um, let's go to the other end of the country, Balfour, Southland. And again, possible fog overnight tonight, going into Tuesday morning, two or three times there. Now, look, it might not be fog because it's only possible fog. We get a bit more certain with other events. But it, it can also point out low cloud. And this um, map, the grey graph you see, that is showing fog and cloud in the mixture. So it's very, very useful, as you say, for duck uh, uh, shooting, which is coming up in a couple of months' time, uh, to check out the fog forecaster. It's a unique product to ruralweather.co.nz. I will have to promote that, actually. Um, now, when it yeah. comes to certainty, we have our uh, My Rural Weather competition where you can win a Proud to be a Farmer enamel uh, camping mug, uh, thanks to the team at Global HQ. And we've selected uh, no other than, of course, because his pulpit has been all about uh, the concern around the dry, is Steve Wynn Harris um, at Hatuma in Hawke's Bay. Steve wants to know... Uh, what's in store over the next month for them in Central Hawke's Bay, Phil? Yeah, well, you know, Steve um, lives in a beautiful part of the country here, Hatuma in uh, Hawke's Bay region. Over here, that's uh, going towards the, the west coast, the Cook Strait area. So, well, feeding into Cook Strait, I should say. So this this location, near the mountains, near ranges, classic place to dry out. When you zoom in, you can really see why. This is where Steve lives, I believe, and you've got a set of ranges near you, but the big main ones out there in the distance looking west towards the Tasman Sea. So this time of the year, we get a lot of westerly winds. They dry out as they come over the ranges. They warm up. That's why it's a beautiful place to live. Lots of sun, lots of dry weather, but the downside is when you need rain, it can be a very tricky place to get it. So I took a look at uh, his forecast on the Rural Weather website. We've got every single Kiwi community on there. There is not one part of New Zealand we do not cover. So you no longer have to worry about where's your nearest airport for your nearest forecast. This is specific to your property, Steve, and it shows pretty much weather. A little burst of rain here, though, later on Thursday. So if you go to the Rural Weather website, you scroll down the page and you'll see daily data. And when you click on that, you go for that Thursday that we were just looking at, and there's a 90% chance of rain, and it says 11.2 millimetres. You can then click on that part and work out specific to where Steve lives over there in Central Hawke's Bay. You can see the rain for that day, for this Thursday. So the pale blue shows the chance of rain, fairly high chance, 85%. So that's a pretty good chance. The dark blue, which is at the bottom of the graph, shows the rainfall totals. So that's where you see that 11 millimetres uh, being accumulated, two, two, one and a half, one, one, one. So it gives you an understanding as to the rain's going to come in around the middle of the day, won't be much, then it clears up. This is why rural weather is so useful because it's not just saying rain on Thursday, it's telling you exactly how that rain will fall, how heavy it will be. And even if this is a little bit wrong, plus or minus a little bit, still gives you the understanding that it's not a day with 100 millimetres of rain on the way. So hopefully that's useful for you, Steve, and for other people around Hawke's Bay and other parts of the of the country really wanting that rain to come back in. I was just thinking it's very handy for when you need to get the sheep undercover uh, before the rain comes, you know, exactly uh, if you've got time for lunch before you do it. Thank you so <laughs> much, Phil, and uh, I really appreciate your time. That's Phil Duncan from Rural Weather, a partner of Global HQs, and of course uh, to Sarah's Country every Monday night on our Newsmaker Mondays. Please head along and uh, check out ruralweather.co.nz, and Steve will be getting that enamel mug off to you. I'd love uh, to get some some South Island um, locations, email me, Sarah at sarahscountry.com. And uh, all you have to do is just flick us through your address and you can go on the drawer for a personalised My Rural Weather weather forecast from no other than Phil Duncan. Uh, it's pretty simple, so send them through, Sarah at Sarah's Country. Now, after the break, the Ministry for Primary Industries principal scientist and winner of the Ray uh, Broham Trophy uh, from the New Zealand Grasslands Association, Gerald Reese, is going to join us to share his story uh, over a very wonderful and colourful career. Farmers Weekly's newsmaker this week as well, Gerald Reese, will join us shortly here on Serious Country. This is Sarah's Country. Catch the latest on the matters that matter most wherever you are. Listen to Sarah's Country on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple or Google Podcasts. Try asking Alexa or Siri. Play Sarah's Country on podcast.
I just, uh, before we get into our last interview in Serious Countries Newsmaker, give a bit of a plug to an event I am looking forward to in the Christchurch Town Hall in the middle of May. Uh, and uh, it is known as Atipu. If you heard of the Boma Grow Summit two years ago, uh, the wonderful uh, the insights that came out of the international speakers, Atipu is the evolution of that. And uh, if it, it attracted about six to 700 people last time. And uh, I've got a special promo code for you, $100 off early bird tickets if you use the promo code Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, that is uh, my little gift to you. I want to see you there. It is. It will leave you super inspirational and pumped about the future ahead and being able to network um, with some incredible people uh, across all types of sectors, marketers, um, experts and things you wouldn't even know you need to uh, Etepu in Christchurch in the middle of May so Google that E-T-I-A E-T-I-P-U my apologies and of course don't forget that $100 promo code Sarah to get that off your tickets now, Colin Willis-Croft's feature in this week's Farmers Weekly's Newsmaker uh, focused on Gerald Reese's extensive career and advocacy of pastoral agriculture and the research behind it. The Ministry for Primary Industries Principal Scientist became the recent winner of the Ray Bomar uh, Trophy presented by the New Zealand Grasslands Association and Gerald joins us now to share his career journey. Firstly, congratulations on behalf of all our listeners and viewers, Gerald, uh, quite rare for a public servant. Yes, thanks for that, Sarah. Um, it is quite um, different, and I was a bit humbled that the association chose a sort of core public servant this time round, somebody that hasn't been sitting at the lab bench or been in the field all of those years, but um, it was really appreciated. Did you know Ray? Um, yes, when Ray was actually just started as director of the Grasslands Division of DSIR in those days, uh, when I started as a young scientist in um, Taranaki, I was the district agricultural scientist there, and I had just come out of Massey. And uh, Ray was well known um, throughout the world, basically, and in New Zealand. He was the guru of grassland science and, and is still recognised as being one of those core cool, um, people. But I was also a bit humbled when I looked down the list of people on the, the trophy, basically, when you see all your friends that you've known over the, the years there as well. And um, I've drunk with most of them as well. So that was really uh, pleasing. Now, you started off your career, uh, of course, growing up on a dairy farm in the southern uh, Rotorua Lakes area. What was the turning point for you to head off into a career of academia? Um. It was actually my father, actually. He was very keen for me to get an education. So uh, rather than taking over the farm, my sister took over the farm and he said, go off to Massey and, and get a further degree, which I did. I, I went to Massey and got a Bachelor of Science. Um, that, that's a four-year degree there. And um, I really enjoyed that. I was then sort of promoted by... Um, one of the professors there, Prof Watkins, basically, who was the head of the agronomy department, and um, he pushed me into the science uh, area, basically. But in those days, uh, MPI used to have HR people that went around the universities at the end of the year sort of looking for, for prospects to employ, and you either became a, a farm advisor or you became a scientist, depending on how did you, well you did it um, at Massey, and I, I did well enough to push, for them to push me into the science career. <laughs> Uh, and then I went up to, uh, to Taranaki. And what was it that uh, you intrigued you around where the science was at the time uh, in agriculture and being able to provide, you know, science-based evidence to policy making in, in the New Zealand's uh, evolution of our grassland uh, pastoral farming systems? Um, I didn't sort of realise that at that stage, I suppose, that the, the, the requirement for innovation in the, um, the, the grassland system. and But uh, math, as it was in those days, actually had this district agricultural science division, basically. So they had scientists in every region of the country, and that was their policy, to try and get science out to the, the farmers. And actually, by having scientists and technical people and doing research in the regions, they could actually then talk directly to the farmers. And that was part of that broader policy. And that was in the sort of early um, uh, to mid-70s, I think it was. And so that, that 
policy I thought was a, a useful policy of getting stuff out there. We used to do national trials on phosphate and fertilisers and, and pasture species. So that's how we got the, the message out to farmers and I think it's, it's still a good way of doing it. Over your uh, multiple decade career, Gerald, uh, in terms of farmers' understanding of you know trial based evidence, peer-to-peer reviews, these technical publications, uh, and being able to have the confidence to trial new um, pastures and forages. What evolution have you seen? Um, I think uh, w- what I have seen, though, is the, the evolution of a, a whole range of um, different means of doing it. So we're getting a lot more sort of media, well, a lot of that's occurred in with, with um, social media, I suppose, in the last decade or so. And I've seen a, a big change in getting information out to farmers more rapidly than what we used to in our days. You know, it's all, well, I didn't have a computer on my desk when I started. I think I had an abacus or something like that. I think back long enough now. And so getting the information out there more rapidly, um, being up to date with it, um, getting it out there through media, and uh, a different range of means. But we still had good um, techniques such as demonstration farms. And I was involved in Taranaki where I was involved with at least three different demonstration farms. So that's a that was a, a key means by which we used to get farmers to see the latest technologies we were working on, the latest pasture species. The one in southern Taranaki was looking at um, species to control pests in those days. Grass grub was really bad in South Taranaki and so they... We ran the Taranaki Research Station at that stage to look at that. So um, things have evolved. We don't tend to have as many um, field days and, and demonstration farms as we used to in those days. We did get hundreds turning up to those those field days, but I don't think there is quite as many these days. Oh, you've just done such a great job of communicating the uh, science, Gerald. That's probably why. And looking through the long list of areas of research that you've been involved in, uh, such as the drought master, perennial ryegrass, um, the nitrogen fixation of white clover, and uh, of course um, legume cultivar cultivation as well. What what's been some of those real standouts that you are really proud of the work that you've been involved with? Well, strangely enough, it was some of my early work where I worked with um, uh, Peter Young from Rukura, and it wasn't actually in, in, in grassland cultivars. It was doing drenching um, livestock with magnesium. And we've done some calculations on the, work, on the work we've done, and we reckon it's been worth billions of dollars to the dairy industry, mainly because farmers now routinely use magnesium supplementation of dairy cows, there's less deaths, there's 15, 10 to 15% greater um, milk production, and that's continued on and farmers are still using that regularly today. So that was one of the first wins, I suppose, as it was were in those days. But I think some of my other wins um, might be more around the establishment of these research stations. I've been involved in, in um, about three different um, stations that have been involved with over the years and they are the, 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 the conduit through which you do the research and get it out there so actually establishing them. The Bukawa Research Station in Hawke's Bay was a was a, um, a classic example right next to the main road you always had to do that because there you get the most farmers would see the new cultivars and their different uh, colours and that on, from the road as they drove past so that's been some of it but some of the new cultivars that I've had over the years including Drought Master that was that was a win basically as well. Climate change and the use of different varietals uh, to be more drought tolerant and provide lower methane admissions is is pretty hot topic at the moment, Gerald. Uh, and and I've discussed it with many a scientists on the program around the tools in the toolbox. What are we not maximising and uh, the lost opportunities? Do you believe? Um, I think. We're getting our we're getting enough uh, evidence base to prove some of these cultivars do have an effect. Now we know that some of the the um, the forage um, kales and stuff like that actually do reduce methane emissions. Um, we think that some of the grass species might do it as well. We're not. Uh, we have to do some more work on some of them still. Um, 
but there is we are looking at inhibitors as well just that that you'd have to give to animals if it's not a, a species per se um and vaccines but where we're making the biggest progress actually is in selecting animals for lower methane levels and we're making some real progress there um, particularly in sheep and the whole program's now starting off on um, looking at uh, dairy animals and beef animals as well so hopefully that will get underway in the next um six months or so. You've sat in a very interesting position uh, between science and policy, Gerald, and uh, and the likes of ryegrass and gene-edited ryegrass and having that national debate. Uh, What's your thoughts? So this question would always come up in this sort of interview. Thanks, Sarah. (laughs) Um, It's... There is, if you look at it, I think it's important that we continue the research looking at some of these techniques, otherwise we will fall behind. But there needs to be a broader discussion on uh, whether these these things would be accepted broadly within the, within New Zealand society. So we have to go through the, the normal processes of the legislation that we've got. Uh, we know that AgriSearch is working on some cultivars at present to look at... Um, whether they can actually reduce methane and um, improve animal performance through through their um, cultivars. So I think we need to progress the science. Um, we need to see what's happening overseas all of the time, um, but we still need societal acceptance of these cultivars, otherwise it's not going to happen. Sounding more like a policymaker than a scientist there, Jill. Well answered. Um, but when it comes to science uh, not being able to catch up with policy, uh, it, it, it really is um, a race in, in to get one before the other. Does it worry you? Um, no, I think we can, you know, policy um, needs to build on the evidence base that's there, I would hope. And um, I think if, if things don't work out, then you look at change it when you do get new knowledge on, on what you're doing, and that does happen regularly as well. Um, science is a slow process, obviously, and dealing with biological systems where you've got these, all this variability of climate and genetics and that it also means that it's not going to be a quick answer all of the time. We've been working on the, the greenhouse gas issue for for 15 years now, I think, trying to get to, to make progress. And we are making progress as we, we move forward and we understand what works and what doesn't work. And I think in the, in the next um, few years, we will see some progress on that. Um, but we've got the new um, Zero Carbon Act with its standards there that we will have to look at how we can meet them in the future. And, of course, um, the ultimate question around funding uh, is there enough of it? And if there's not and we needed more, where would you help distribute it? So funding is a perennial question. You, you should never ask a scientist whether there's enough funding because you know what the answer is. There's, there's, uh, normally there's a, a limited funding, but I've been on the, the funding side of the equation where we're handing out the funding and it's, it's um, normally there's more good ideas than there is um, funding available. Um, in terms of getting more funding, we have, science has to stand in line with all the other elements that the government's got to, you know, to share its tax on basically. So we have to see where it fits in the equation. You know, currently we're trying to get a cope with the COVID economy that we've got. Where does science fit in that? Um, I think we, we try and work with what we do. There's a range of ways there where there could be um, more funding through the Commodities Levies Act and a few other areas as well. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gerald, for taking the time to come on uh, Serious Country. Is of course, this week's Farmers Weekly Newsmaker, and Gerald Reese there, who uh, has recently been awarded the Ray Broham Trophy by the New Zealand Grasslands Association, an award that has humbled him in his win. And, of course, knowing Ray, uh, he is certainly, from his extensive career in advocacy of our pastoral agriculture, a very, very well-deserved um, after having a chat to 
Richard Gerald there. Of course, uh, you can catch all of Sarah's Country On Demand on podcast. All the individual interviews are there as well as the full show. And of course, to watch any of the interviews back and make sure you share, uh, head to sarahscountry.com. Uh, we are now Sarah's Country on Facebook, which is very exciting. And uh, it's, it's easier to find and where we live stream Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday from 7 p.m. Now tomorrow on our Opinion Maker Tuesdays, uh, we have been asked with the task to find 50,000 workers. Well, that was what Nathan Guy said in 2014. What needs to change uh, to be able to um, find these 50,000 people we need uh, by simply 2025? We know of the labour shortages that we're currently experiencing in the primary sector. So how broken is the system and why haven't we been able to attract? This isn't a COVID problem. Uh, It certainly was there entrenched for years before. We have a great lineup of uh, very experienced people in the industry. It will give us their insights into what needs fixing and how we're going to go about finding the massive labour shortages within our industry. Featuring Federated Farmers Skills and Training Spokesperson William Beetham, Dairy Trainings Manager Kath Blake, uh, a new sharing training called Womo Life and also behind Agricultural Education Virtual Training Online Managing Director Alistair Sheenan and Sharing Contractor Association Chief Executive Phil Holden will be on the show with me tomorrow live from 7pm on uh, Sarah's Country Facebook and YouTube channel you can watch along live as well as of course it will be their first thing for you in the morning on podcasts and please get in touch with me sarah at sarahscountry.com if you'd like to suggest any guests on the show and uh, of course your feedback on any of the interviews that you've had i can also help pair you up with any of the uh, wonderful inspiring leaders that we have from grassroots right to boardroom across aotearoa new zealand in the meantime take care of yourself and particularly in the stressful time of more lockdowns and uh, if it is not affecting you personally remember it is affecting somebody uh, near you so please be respectful to those in the meantime ka kite anō